All right, so whenever I do these Instagram live shows, I always start off with a, a pretty common problem in golf and then uh, describe it and describe what's supposed to be right um, and then move on to some questions. So we're, we're going to do that again. Um, and then I always give a coupon code to buy some premium videos to support the channel. Uh, the code today is POWER. For you, P O W E R, all caps, the number four, and then a capital U. Um, it's for the power ship video, it's a video where I describe how most good players um, shift, which is significantly different than what we've always been taught. So hopefully today I won't screw the camera angle up too many times. I have to do it at least once. Um, save the questions for a little bit. I'll try to get to all of them. Okay, so we've all been taught for a hundred plus years that you shift to the right in the backswing and you shift to the left in the downswing. And I thought that was true. And then as I've learned more and as I've seen the way players shift and seen how the forces work, this is a terrible idea. So you'll see a lot of people say, in order to get to the left side, you want to push off the right side. There are no circumstances where that's going to be a good golf swing. If you're up here and you push off the right side, that's early extension all day long, and it's too late. Now, the important factor here is vertical force in this shift. Not only that, you know, some other factors too, but we all want to hit the ball farther using the ground vertical force. So just to get technical here for a second, the vertical force vector is this way, up and back, which is why you see the long hitters, they push and their left foot will go this way, okay? All right, now, someone explained to me how you can push off the right side and get this to work. So, in physics, action reaction. It's called ground reaction force. And in physics, middle school physics, we know for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if the ground reaction force vector is this way, we know the action force is that way. So when you watch elite golfers, they shift to the right early in the backswing. And most golfers are reaching their maximum right side around shaft parallel or left arm parallel, then you'll see them start to work this way. Now it's not a big squat, because the pelvis in elite golfers only moves down about that much. But what we want to see is at the end of the backswing, it doesn't matter when, you'll see a lot of golfers go, a lot of like DeChambeau will start going left around here. Then you'll see Tiger and Rose do it about here, and then you'll see like Rory go right, 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 left, okay? As long as you're doing it, after a shift to the right, you don't want to go like this. You have that shift to the right, maximum right side pressure is in here somewhere, and then as you rotate to the top, you go down and left. Now all of a sudden your momentum is moving this way, like a pitcher. A pitcher is still turning as they start to move toward the plate. Quarterback, they're still rotating away as they step forward, okay? So this whole idea of pushing off the right side and loading the right side at the top of the swing, these are antiquated concepts that just turned out to not be true when elite players are measured. So. This is another thing that was confusing to me for a while, too. Everybody thinks that you bump the hips to shift into the left side, okay? Well, you can do it that way, but that's not the easiest on your body, and that's not the way you see most elite players do it. Most elite players, when they get to about right here, their right hip and right shoulder work around and behind them 
to load into that left side. This is not a reverse pivot. This is not any of those bad things you heard. Reverse pivot is going left and tilting toward the target. I'm going right first, and then the right side is working behind me and getting me into the left side as my spine is still just a few degrees tilted away from the target. So that's a little explanation about how it works. My video called Power Shift goes into all these things in great detail and has drills on how to get this done. But quite honestly, the sway the weight into the mass weight shift, swaying the pelvis, it's just not the easiest and best way to swing the club, okay? It's when you move your arms and hands, look at how that makes my weight and pressure go to the right foot, then I can rotate back left and use the ground and use that vertical force. You know, they have data on this. It's what good players do. It's been measured. You know, I teach this to people every day. And the difference between, for the average golfer, I'm not talking about elite players, the difference in club head speed for the average golfer when they sway and load the right side and then try and rush left, you're not going to go from 80-90% right to 80-90% left in the amount of time it takes a downswing. You need to get the momentum moving that way as you reach the top. And the club head speed change, when I just teach this simple concept of instead of swaying the right hip at the top of the swing, getting the right hip around and behind and initiating that shift as you reach the top, it's 10%. Some get 8, some get 15, it's 10%. 10% more club head speed. Um, do the math. You know, if you're swinging your 9 iron at 80 miles an hour, and now you're swinging it at 88. That's a seven iron now, okay? So getting this right has a huge effect on club head speed. And for all of you that say, I flip and stall, this is how you get the handle forward. Instead of being here and having to try and hold angles and shove everything forward, which is the wrong way to do it, more ways to lose speed. So that's my little, you know, beginning of the Instagram live rant where I talk about uh, a concept that's, you know, been, I'm sorry to say, incorrectly taught. I had the incorrect perception for years. But when you study the data, you study what good players do. Um, one real big one, you notice if you watch the... now. We're throwing away the people that go like this, that go straight into the left side and tilt their spines. Okay, yeah, they need to learn how to move better. But when you watch the average golfer, at the top of their swing, their right leg is vertical. I have an Instagram post um, that you can look up, and I had um, Dustin Johnson and Justin Rose two guys that have been number one in the last 10 years. And then I had Woods, Nick, Young Jack Nicholas, Sneed, and Hogan, arguably the four greatest players of all time. At the top of their swing, they were not loaded into the right side. At the top of their swing, they were all moving this way and had angled toward the target with their right leg. You'll see a lot of golfers sway their pelvis and have that rounded right leg. Terrible. Not going to recover from that. But you'll see most elite golfers at the top of the swing, if you draw a line down from the edge of their right hip, it's inside their heel, not out, uh, inside their foot, not outside their foot with the rounded leg. So if you see that rounded leg or that vertical leg, can you play from there? You absolutely can. Colin Montgomery did a pretty good job of that. But it's just harder. That's where golfers get confused. They're like, well, these three golfers, you know, whenever I discuss something, well, this guy, this guy, and this guy, they did the opposite of what you're saying, and they beat you. Yes, there are always exceptions. But, and 
It's not in terms of right and wrong. It's in terms of easier. Is it easier to get, let's just throw a round number, 80% of your weight into the left side? Is it easier to do that when you're static 90% at the top or when you're about 60 or 70 at the top and moving left? That's obviously a rhetorical question. We are not looking for rights and wrongs in the golf swing because there are always exceptions and there are in fact more than one way to swing a golf club. But these ideas are used as excuses to, for people to do things the hard way and for people to teach the hard way. We want to all put our head, collective heads together and let's make this easier. And getting the shift to start moving left as the last move of the backswing versus the first move of the downswing is going to make it easier. So, there's my rant for the day. For those of you that just got on, power for you, P-O-W-E-R for the letter U, all caps. Get yourself a discount on the power shift video. What I just went through for 10 minutes there, it's uh, explained in detail and there's drills. My videos are not expensive. They're very comprehensive. They're easy to understand. Um, it's the way you support the channel so I can give away so much free information. And they're helpful and educational and grab it. All right? So uh, let's start taking some questions here. Let's see if there were some asked already. And then we'll start um, answering some of these. What's the best way to simplify the swing? Buy all of my videos and listen to what I say. Um, kidding aside, you got to make your movements more efficient. And that's one of the ones we're talking about. Shifting your weight into the right side and loading the right side at the top is not simplifying the swing. Holding angles, float loading, um, you know, firing body parts and in different directions. That's not the way to simplify it. Um, make your swing more efficient. Please post these videos on YouTube. I do. Okay, let's see if we can get some questions here. Maybe not. Maybe I've answered them all already. Uh, let's see. Let the body follow mo the momentum of the club, basically. That's, that's a way you can look at it. You have to be careful. Um, following the momentum of the club, depending on how you interpret it, can be good or bad. So quite simply, if you have it in your mind, I'm going to follow the momentum, have the body follow the momentum of the club. Uh, GMC2525 said this. If you watch the video and it looks good and you strike the ball well, you're interpreting that field correctly. If you get all sorts of bad, then you're, you know, it, feels are all about um, how you personally interpret them. So we have two discussions. Discussion A. What actually happens in a good swing? Discussion B, what can we feel personally? Those are separate discussions and both of them have to be done. Let's see. Golf Motion Academy, what up, Monty? What up? I think this is when everybody started rolling in here. Similar weight shift on a 50 yard pitch? No. Okay, great question. Okay, this is a seven iron, but pretend like it's an L wedge. Okay, I don't have my L wedge, it's in the car. All right, so. One of the biggest issues people have with both little pitches around the greens, 50 yards is starting to get out to close to a partial wedge, 
but we'll just call it a pitch. Partial wedges, knock down iron shots and whatnot. Flighting the ball. So part of the reason why you want that initial shift into the right side, that's going to create power, speed, torque. We want that initial shift. We don't want to go straight into the left side. But now when we're talking about partial shots, pitches around the greens, um, like I said, 50-yard pitch, you're going to try and hit your 7-iron as far as you normally hit a 9-iron or bring it in low. The biggest mistake that people make is excess shift into the right side. So let's say I'm hitting a 50-yard pitch, which is essentially going to be this much of a swing. If I go just to here and I shift my weight into the right side, I'm never going to get back left. Bad low point, bad face path control, you're cooked. So whenever you're hitting a shorter swing or a partial shot, my opinion, see now we're into my opinions, my opinion is you should in fact go straight left. If you watch the amazing um, turnaround that Victor Hovland had last year with my, my good buddy Joe Mayo, you know, let's forget the difference of opinion and debate. Joe made Victor better. End of story. And if you watch his before and after of his pitch shots, his before, he's got a giant weight shift into the right side with that vertical leg, and he couldn't control his low point. And Joe had him going left and significantly left to control that low point. So when you're hitting a 50-yard pitch, when you're trying to hit a flighted 7-iron, the distance of your 9-iron, you don't need the momentum of shifting right first and then back to the left to create vertical force and momentum and all that good stuff. You don't want that. You're trying to control the trajectory and control the speed and control the distance so we don't need this excess movement that messes with our low point. So we just want to go straight into the left side. Now there's going to be, if you put yourself on a pressure mat, just for those that you that are nerds like me and want to hear this, as soon as you take the club away, you can see just the momentum of me moving my arm in the club makes me move this way. So you got to be careful that it doesn't turn into this. So you really have to work hard to get yourself into that left side early. Let's say you're hitting a 20-yard pitch. You're only going to go to here. You better not shift right or you're never getting back to the ball with anything other than an ugly compensation. Good question. <sighs> and this, um, this uh, I, I call this shot, the four lefts. I've talked about this before. The way that you flight the ball is not purposely de-lofting it. You take off speed and you change the low point by ball forward in your stance, not back. All right, let's talk about this. So the way people will keep the ball down whether they're trying to, um, you know, hit it under the wind, under a tree, partial shot, whatever, they'll put the ball way back in their stance, karate chop at the ball and try and de-loft it. You're going to get terrible compression when you do that. Compression is not the divot. Um, shots with divots can be more poorly compressed than a swept shot because compression is about how much loft you deliver to the club, uh, deliver to the ball, and your angle of attack. So if I'm like this, I'm gonna be super, super steep, okay? So what I do to bring the ball down, I call it the four lefts. Left number one, ball more forward in your stance. That's gonna make you more shallow or more shallow to the ball. Left number two, more weight on your left side and address, okay? Left number three, stay left, don't shift to the right. And then left number four, make your normal shift to the left side. Now, 
you don't have to actively manipulate the club to get the ball flight down to deliver less loft. The ball's more forward, your weight's more forward, you shift forward, you shift forward with your natural swing and release. You're gonna deliver less loft and you're not gonna be super steep. What I see a lot of golfers from the handicaps of like five to 20, when they do this, they get to right here and they panic and they go like this and then they either pop it up into the tree or hit a shot with too much spin and the wind kills it. So if you wanna bring the ball down, more left, more left, more left, more left, and just make your regular swing. All righty. I purchased Use the Bounce and love the content so far. Quick question for the average hack. Would it improve solid contact by having the face slightly open? Sure. That's one of those personal preference things. Some people like to have the face more open to expose more bounce and it helps them visualize the ball going in the air more. Some people look at the open face and they lose their minds. So that's a, that's a personal preference. Okay. Does a stronger grip help wrist flexion in the downswing? No. Um, you, uh, grip is independent. Um, what a stronger grip helps you do is hinge better, okay? If you have a super weak grip, it's harder to hinge. But you still need to do that flexing motion with your wrist at some point. Uh, that was Anil Bahaj, 11. ZM4219. Are you still maintaining flex in the right knee? Great question. This is a huge point of contention. So, I think I can get, I've been campaigning against this for 20 years. And I think you'd get Jason Day to agree with me. Maintaining a dress flex in the knee is an awful concept in my opinion. It doesn't allow freedom of movement in the pelvis. It doesn't allow a natural shift like I'm talking about. And it puts excess pressure on your lower back. Okay? But just like everything else in golf, the opposite of bad is also bad. You don't want to get up there and hyperextend the right knee, which I've seen people do as well. So, the term maintaining flex can have two meanings. It can mean maintain the address flex, which a lot of people, even great players, Brooks Kupka, Keegan Bradley, have misinterpreted throughout their careers. A lot of instructors, a lot of average golfers. I believe that is not the easiest and best way to do it. In my opinion, the term maintaining flex would be maintain some of the flex. So let's say we have 15 degrees, 20 degrees, whatever, okay? We don't want 15 to 20 at the top. We don't want minus five at the top, hyperextension. So we wanna go from 20, let's use a nice round number like 20, to six, okay? So maintaining flex in the knee means don't hyperextend it and lock it. It doesn't mean maintain a dress flex because that will restrict your hip movement and make a shift harder to do. Good question. Cook with Ann, 2434. Boast about your eyeline topic set up and throughout the swing that you said doesn't get a lot of engagement it's resonated with me. Curious if you can elaborate on it from a face-on view as well. Excellent. Okay. So recently I've posted several golfers. I didn't change their swing at all. Every one of these golfers, I think I've posted like about four or five of them. 
had the same problem and had the same result. And the concept, I call it, you hit it where you look. So when you're set up, if I put the shaft in front of my eyes, my eyes are pointing at the target. And this is an extremely common problem. When people are trying to come from the inside and rotate more, their eye line tilts like this. And from the face on, it looks like that. This is awful. Because one of two things is going to happen. For the more experienced golfer that knows they're supposed to come from the inside, they're going to swing. All right, let's do an experiment here. I've done this many times, okay? So I'm a little stiff, so bear with me. I'm coming off a little bit of a back injury from cleaning my garage, all right? So here's me maintaining more or less that parallel to the target eye line. Okay? So if you can see that, yeah, it didn't rotate very well. Club path, four degrees out to the right, inside out. Not bad, not my ideal, I like two or three degrees. Now, in my mind, I'm gonna make the same golf swing, but I'm going to tilt my eyes this way. Now, in my mind, that was the same swing, 14 degrees in and out. And as you can see, big sweeping drop. So when you're 14 degrees in and out, you essentially have two choices. Hit it over there or flip it and hit a big hook, which is what I did. I'm an experienced enough golfer. I made it work. I kind of hit it at the target. The same can be true if for whatever reason you tilted the eye line this way, okay, which you see a lot of beginners do. Again, in my mind, the same swing, nine degrees over the top, big pull. So you will generally hit the ball where you look. You'll see a lot of inexperienced golfers go like this, tilt their eye line over there, and panic and go, oh my God, the target's over there, and they're whoosh. So tilting the eye line that way can make you over the top as well. Now, people will always counterpoint me and say, whenever I say something, there's always the dissenters. And they're like, well, you're not right on this because Jack Nicholas and now Dustin Johnson, they tilt their head and they're better than you are. That's always the argument. Pro X does what you say is bad and they're better than you. Fine, they are better than me, okay? But there's an important distinction. When Johnson and Nicholas tilt their head, they tilt it this way. So their eye line is still relatively parallel to the target line. So watch the difference. Okay? So there's a huge distinction between what Johnson and Nicholas do and what the 5 to 20 handicapper does that gets their pathway out to the right. Okay, and a lot of people will do it for the two reasons I stated before. They want to swing from the inside, so then they go like this, so they can visualize the in to out path. And a lot of them will add fake turn. So look, if I turn, that's as much as I can go, because I'm stiff, coming off a back injury. But if I tilt my head line and eye line, I can make some false turn. Too flat, out of position, no bueno, all bad. So this is why getting eye line is correct is so, so important. What is the center of the backswing turn? Body is fixed on two legs. Where is the center? You could, it, it's different for everybody because the center moves position. The center of the pelvis moves a little away from the target and then a little toward the target. The sternum moves a little back and forth. 
So the actual center is a measured position that's not actually on the body. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a feel question. And for each individual, I will teach them how to rotate correctly. And then they say, well, it feels like I'm rotating around my left shoulder. And I'm like, there you go. That's not correct, but from a math standpoint, but from a math standpoint, often the center of rotation is not even on the body. It's somewhere outside the body. So, you know, that's kind of a individual question on what you need to feel. Is the power shift going to be the same with a driver and an iron? Absolutely. Um, you're going to create more force and more movement the longer the club is. But if you're trying to max out that club, yeah, it's exactly the same. Jigga Joe 3. JD Sun Valley. What is the best position for your arms and body to swing left? Um, you have to be careful with that one. Um, swinging left on purpose can cause issues. Um, and I'm going to answer what you're supposed to do by answering your question. The better you sequence the movement of your arms and hands with the rotation of your body in transition. Okay, so. So if you take it back, shift, sync up your arms and hands to your body, okay, then it becomes real simple. Push up and rotate and the hands move left. That's still going to be in the out path or a neutral path. If you get up here and try and swing low and left with the arms and hands, you're going to create a lot of sequence problems and path and face problems that you don't want. So purposely swinging low and left, unless you're the most uber of elite golfers, usually ends up poorly at some point. Whereas if you just learn sequence properly and let everything kind of play its way out, those things generally tend to happen. Oh, there you go. That's This is a great comment. Uh, Neville Eric. Hey, Monty, I've been getting better at this and got rid of my sway, but it doesn't work with my old release pattern. Now I'm dragging the handle through with the face 10 degrees open. What's wrong? What's wrong is, is you learned to move your hands and wrists incorrectly to match the poor shift and rotational pattern. And you have to allow your body time to adapt to the new shift and rotation. Now, if I looked at it, I could tell you what needs to happen. But if you try to do it on purpose, it may, notice I said may, slow your progress. But, you know, it's just going to take you time to adapt to, to the new. I mean, the center of your pelvis is probably four to six inches different than it was before. So your old release pattern ain't gonna work. So you just have to allow the new release pattern to develop and kind of do an external focus of trying to picture a push draw instead of that white B shot that you're hitting from raking across it and holding off to manage your old, your old hip pattern. So that's um, internal, external focus. Internal, so you have half the people out there saying, oh, it's got to be internal focus. You need to learn positions and, you know, feels don't work. And, you know, you have to learn all the positions and put your body there. And feels and, and you know, picturing shots just doesn't work. And I go like this to that. Then you have people that say, oh, you shouldn't work on mechanics. There should be no internal focus. Golf should be all about feel and timing and visualizing the shot. And to those people, I'm like, all right, that's fine. 
Um, the simple answer is you have to have both. If you don't understand where your poor movement pattern is and what the poor movement pattern is and what a better movement pattern is, your feels and external foci, I'll be grammatically correct, focuses, um, aren't going to be directed properly. So while I agree we can't be standing over the ball thinking of 18 different positions and movements, we need to know what those movements are and how they apply in order to put the proper feel and proper external focus into play. So your external focus right now is you need to visualize a push draw, maybe even a big block hook like you're hooking it around a tree. As you can tell, my voice is even more gravelly than usual. I call it the 90-year-old lady with emphysema voice. Been a little under the weather, even more raspy than usual. Okay, next question. Fantastic answer to my 50-yard pitch question. Thank you. Absolutely. Can you please go over cast B? Okay, good question. Okay, so for those of you that don't know what cast B, I made a video 12, 15 years ago toward the, called the no turn cast, where I said basically that hinging your wrist correctly prevents you from over swinging with the arms and allowing the angles to unload actually helps you sustain them longer, okay? So in the video, I call cast A the unloading of the vertical hinge toward eight o'clock. And then cast B is unloading the horizontal hinge from here to here, okay? So, no turn cast, it's one of my premium videos. Everybody finds it helpful in some way. Everybody finds it helpful in different ways, but get it if you don't have it. This is not me being a salesman. This is gonna help you understand how the swing works. So for a hundred years, it's been hold the lag for shaftling. And the truth be told, pretty much nobody good does either one of those things. Like you'll see guys like um, Gary Woodland, he'll go up, he'll have a late set, get a little bit of extension in his wrist, then turn it down to this position, okay? Drop the right shoulder a little bit. Um, you see Sergio with all of this angle, but that's mostly from flattening the shaft. In reality, we know two things. Number one is that Elite golfers have their hands mostly ahead of the ball with either a flat or slightly bowed left wrist at impact. We all know that, everybody knows that. What most people don't know is, is that when 150 tour players were measured like eight, 10 years ago, from here to here, only one of them was increasing their left wrist angle this way. That was Daniel Berger. Everybody else from here to there was moving their wrist this way. So, if we know 104, that's cast B in the video, allowing this angle to unload, cast B, okay? I know that's called a flip more than a cast. Now, if we know that 149 out of 150 are moving this way, and if we know basically everybody is that way, then when we're here, this wrist better be at this angle. Doesn't have to be like Dustin Johnson or John Rum, but it better be at this angle. I don't think anybody's disagreeing so far. Now, if we're going this wide to narrow float load motion, we're gonna get this angle in the wrist. Whereas, if as we're putting force this way with the body and the arms, if we're putting force that way with the club head, 
Now we get this angle, and the club head is behind our hands. This is the lag angle that's important. The club head lagging the hands here instead of there. And if you try and make this angle, look at how terrible that is. Look at how open the face is. But if I unload that angle, now look how perfect I'm, I am. Okay? So the whole point of no turn cast is set the angles and let them unload. If you're unloading them, casting or flipping, it's not because you're not holding them. It's because you're doing something else wrong. Okay? So cast B is allowing this angle to unload as you're coming around the corner. And here's the proof. Dustin Johnson, Mr. This Angle, if you look at him over here, his wrist looks like this because he's releasing the angle. Okay? There it is. You know, if, if you see the data, you can make sense of these things. And holding angles is just not the right way to do it. Everybody always asks good questions. Assuming there is little to no shaft lean with driver at impact, can it feel like you should release earlier with driver compared to irons? Notice I'm making some faces here. I'm a big believer that you develop consistency through the bag by having the swings are going to be different. I'm not going to say hitting a wedge 100 yards and hitting a driver 300 is the same swing. But when you start having different intents with different clubs, you start to get yourself into trouble. Let's be honest. It's like playing draws and fades regularly. Most tour players don't do that. Let's be honest with ourselves. Making our A swing is hard enough without adding all these variables. So let's have another discussion here. So all I have in the bay here is my seven iron and this hybrid that somebody was hitting, okay? So, understand this. Pretend this is an L wedge and this is a driver. So I'm gonna grip it down here for the L, well, that should be out right there. And then I'm gonna grip this as if it were a driver, okay? So, you don't hit up on a driver and you don't hit down on an iron. The L wedge, I'm closer to the ball and the swing plane is going to be more, the swing arc, I hate the word plane, is going to be more upright. This is going to be flatter, more tilted, flat. Now, more often than not, the ball position on the, on the driver up on the left armpit. On the wedge, it's here. So when you get down five on an L wedge and up one on a driver, you're not hitting down on the iron and you're not hitting up on the driver. You are swinging these clubs on the same arc and I'm hitting the iron, the wedge, before the bottom of the arc, five down, and I'm hitting this at the bottom or slightly after the bottom of the arc, level or plus one. There's a reason why the average tour player hits pretty level on the driver because when you start trying to hit up on it, you start putting these nasty movements on the ball. Okay? So, have the same intent with your movements with every club in the bag and let the difference in length of the club and set up distance from the ball and ball position dictate when you hit it on the arc not intent to hit down and hit up. All right. Oh. Chipping question from Damian Wilkins 103. 
Is the current thinking about steep angle of attack and taking a divot a good way for the amateur to develop their short game? Do we all need to revise, use the bounce? Thanks. Okay, so. So, big discussion, okay? My friend Joe Mayo pretty much started the controversy. He had Victor Hovland hitting down 10, okay? Then you have guys like myself, um, Stan Utley, um, Short Game Chef, fellow Bruin, Parker. Love all these guys. I love all of them. They're all great instructors. Brian Manzello was part of the thing. Another phenomenal instructor. To me, this is my opinion now. I see value in both of them. They're two different kinds of shots. And... Each golfer has to find out whether the steep one is good for them, the shallow one is good for them, or they are proficient at both and will use them for different kinds of shots. Revising what has worked. See, there's, there's two different schools of thought here. Um, should we improve our thinking like you have done with the golf swing in general? No holding lag, no shifting weight, all that good stuff. Well, I only revised that because when I studied and saw the measurements of elite golfers, they weren't doing that, okay? But you can see elite golfers doing both of these methods. So to me, that means both of them are viable and it becomes a personal choice. So... Um, when I heard the arguments that like, when I heard what Parker said, when I heard what Manzella said, when I heard what Joe Mayo said, I didn't hear anything wrong in anything of what they said on how a shot should be produced. So if this sounds like being politically wishy-washy, because I like all of these people, it's not. I'm saying neither of them are wrong. Both have their benefits. Both have their shortcoming, okay? It just depends on who you are and whether you should do one, the other, or have both, okay? One is going to be pretty high, not as much spin. One of them is going to be fairly low, tons of spin, and then there's hybrid and in between. Which shot do you want? In my opinion, for a pro, they can do whatever the heck they want and make it work. For the two handicap, the same, but not as good. For a 12-15 handicap, the less spin, the better, in my opinion. Um, so, but on the other hand, Joe showed me a video of a 12 that he got to do it this way, and it improved the guy. So, there's, there's no right or wrong here. There's easier for the individual. So there you go. Boy, was that wishy-washy. I didn't want to say anything bad about anybody. Um, those of you that know me know I'm not afraid to say, see what this guy said? Wrong. Terrible. He's not right. So I'm not afraid to do that. But in this case, um, everything that I've heard makes perfect sense. And, you know, it was hard for me to watch friends and colleagues kind of get a little heated. Um, and I don't think anybody's taking it personally. It's just a, a, a passionate debate. Okay, let me go back here. Okay. Um, DJAB1212, working on shaft lean coming from a flip. Right arm straightens very early in the downswing before impact. Is that an issue or am I focusing on the wrong thing? You're focusing on the wrong thing. Um, Hypothetical, I can snap my fingers and say, you will have shaft lean and you will have a bent right elbow at impact. And I snap my fingers and you could do it. Your handicap would go up five to 10 strokes, okay? And I know you're listening to this right now and maybe many of you are going, wait a second, wait a second. Straightening the right elbow early is bad and flipping and not having shaft lean is bad. I agree. But 
you are doing something much earlier in the swing. Maybe something as simple as grip or ball position, but there's something happening earlier in the swing that's forcing you to straighten your right elbow and flip the club to create a functional shot. And if all you did was insert a bent right elbow and shaft lean, you'd hit it worse. The face would be open, you'd hit it thin, any number of ugly variables. So you have to address why you're not leaning the shaft and why your elbow straightening too early. Fix that and then those things will start to come along. Um, there are so many things it could be, I'm not even gonna guess, but it could go all the way back to your setup. All righty. Mayo changed my short game from Golf Motion Academy. Yeah. I mean, so let, let, let's, I mean, there are more people on, let's just, because this was the discussion at the golf show at the Open Forum. Mayo versus short game chef. Steep versus shallow. And then Menzella came in on discussing friction and spin loft. I honestly didn't hear one thing in that argument that I disagreed with. Everybody was putting forth proper information. You have to do what works for you. Now, maybe objectively there's a, well, this is a better mathematical shot. I'm not going anywhere near that discussion. I understand physics on an elementary level. I understand the numbers on a fairly high level. I am not going to be part of the debate where it's uber high level physics and numbers because I'll be above my pay grade. My pay grade is not numbers and science. I listen to the experts and then my area of expertise where I feel like I'm up here is applying the information to the golfer. That's where my skill is. So I don't argue too much with the experts. Now, if somebody rolls along and they're like, yeah, this is all BS and, you know, uh, uh, a pull hook is over the top with top spin. That's ridiculous. That are, those are not the facts. I will argue facts that are accepted. I will not argue nuances of physics and, you know, 20,000 collected data points. I don't want to go anywhere near that. So I, I think both ways are viable. Both, both, ways, both ways are extremely successful. Do what works for you. Is the modern rotational swing an actual thing or is it just the golf marketing industry terminology? Is it different from what you teach? From Justin Four. I think modern swing, one, anything that labels something and pigeonholes something is a marketing term in my opinion. Like when I call it no turn cast, power shift, broom force, these are marketing terms to catch people's attention. Um, a good golf swing is a good golf swing. Okay? Um, so, in my opinion, so here's where I differ. So, let's just take a friend of mine, George Gankus. Love George. One of the nicest guys, funniest guys you'll ever meet. I have nothing bad to say about George or the way he teaches the worst thing that I can say about George is on one or two issues in the swing, we have a different, slightly different perception on how it works, okay? Um, and in this case, there are a lot of people that say that rotation is what flattens the shaft. I don't think that's the case. I believe movement of the wrist and the right elbow is what flattens the shaft, okay? Am I right? Is George right? I don't think it matters in this case because when George takes his client, if George and I had twin brothers and they were both 15 handicaps and he taught his way and I taught my way and we got them both down to fives, 
they would have been told completely different information on how to get there. And they'd look very similar at impact. So when it comes to the nuances, you know, there really is, you know, two different camps. People will say there's multiple camps. Because like um, Dana Dahlquist, who is another outworldly instructor, Jake Hutt, another friend of mine, funny guy, great communicator. They say keep the left arm to the chest and tilt and turn. I, I'm not a fan of that. Doesn't make them wrong and make me right. When, you know, we, Dana and I have given lessons to the same person on multiple occasions. And I've been told by every one of those people that we explained what they were supposed to do differently, but we both wanted them to arrive at the same place. So I'm doing a very political, uh, correct way of saying there are two camps. The people that actually know what they're talking about have studied the information and make people better. And the people that promote BS and old school thinking and things that good players just don't do. And people try to divide camp A into, well, this guy's a rotational guy. This guy's an arm guy. This guy's a this guy. This guy's a that guy. It's not true. We're teaching the same thing from a different perception. We know what a good golf swing is. We're approaching it differently. So you don't look at it as modern rotational. Try and look at it as these guys know what they're talking about. Different ways of explaining it. These guys are full of BS, have no idea what they're talking about. Making those distinctions, not always easy, but try. Because if you listen to this group, you're gonna get better. If you listen to this group, you might have that eureka aha moment on the range where you're like, this is the greatest thing ever, and you're gonna make yourself worse. Long-term progress you're gonna find in this group over here. The people that give lessons, that make people better, that study the information, and just come out with different perceptions on how to communicate the correct information. So we're getting close to the end of the hour here. I apologize if I wasn't answering everybody's question. I think we're gonna go with, with one more here. Um, why might my, my trail knee collapse and hip fire early? Reese Meyer. Okay, we can look at this a bunch of different ways. I assume you mean this, okay? I'll make it as simple as I can. In an elite golf swing, the hips fire two one hundredths of a second before the arms. That's basic, if you, if you jog a golf swing with a, um, a second um, counter, you're gonna see 200 of a second is about this much, okay? So when you actively try to fire your lower body, lead with the lower body, you throw that sequencing off. So for some people, they need to feel fire everything at once. For some people, they need to feel, get the arms all the way down to here before they go. The Justin Rose feel, as I like to call it, because he had a great video on that. But it's all about your sequencing. This is firing out early, leaving this behind. Whereas everything moves at once, the right hip doesn't fire out, the knee doesn't collapse. And it could also be a matter of, when elite players rotate, this is a power shift thing, this is in that video, they're into the left side, they can pull their left hip back. Okay, so this doesn't fire out. If you're stuck on the right side, you end up having to do that. So it could be one of those two things. Sequencing issue or a poor shift. Um, both, of the, both of those things are covered in the power shift. So it's capital P, capital O, capital W, capital E, capital R. Number four, big U. All right, great questions, everybody. I'm sorry I didn't get to answer all of them. Um, Hope you learned a few things. Grab the video, it'll help. Grab all of them. 
Uh, thanks for showing up.